Hello, I'm Todd Barron with the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I'm also a co-editor of Video GIE, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Richard Kazarek for our master's interview series. Dr. Kazarek was and has always been an inspiration to me in my career. Um, I discovered him by reading gastrointestinal endoscopy articles um, and before PubMed, uh, noticed in his work um, during my fellowship, early fellowship in gastrointestinal medicine. And we met during my third year of fellowship training while he had visited Duke University Medical Center and I was working with Peter Cotton. And we've um, had a great relationship since then. Dick has been a mentor to me and an inspiration and an advisor both personally and professionally. Um, so it's an honor to have him talk to us today about his uh, career and how he got to where he is. So thank you, Todd. Thank you for being here today. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you came to be in medicine? Uh, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest in Wisconsin. Um, uh, it was about 5,000 people, still probably about 5,000 people. Um, <laughs> poor farming at the time. It was the edge of the glaciated area, but cranberries came in, and cranberries are king in that area right now. So I have um, six brothers and sisters. Uh, I came from a medical family. My father was a family physician. Uh, my mother was a medical technologist. Um, I've got two brothers who are physicians. Another one is a geologist, three sisters who are nurses. It took me a while to realize I was from both a medical and a sexist family <laughs> and simultaneously. Um, I had a high school class of about 200 people, very small. Um, went to the University of Wisconsin for eight years. I was a philosophy major mm -hmm. and um, it was during tumultuous times. Um, it was during the Vietnam War and we had National Guard on campus for three of our semesters. Um, uh, some of the players in that uh, stole an ROTC uh, plane and bombed the campus uh, oh. from an ROTC plane. Uh, the math building was uh, destroyed by a fertilizer bomb. Oh killing uh, uh, some one of the investigators who was there late at night. Mm. So a uh, tumultuous uh, time on campus. Um, I also went to medical school at University of Wisconsin in Madison and uh, I spent the first three years uh, on campus and then the fourth year I was all over the place. I uh, spent time at the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage. Um, I spent time in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, delivering babies and working in the emergency room every oh. other night. And then I uh, spent time in Bluefield, Princeton, West Virginia, and time in um, a small rural town in in Wisconsin. So um, at that time I thought I was going to be a primary care doctor and I got lots of experience all over the all over the uh, country if you will. Um, I could not stand the fact that the match was going to tell me where I was going to go and so when I was in um, Alaska I was coming back on the train and I met somebody who said, oh, if you like Alaska, you love Nova Scotia, you love Newfoundland, and I didn't know where they, either one of them were. <laughs> but I remember going back to the hospital library and looking up uh, Canadian hospitals and uh, applying to Canadian hospitals, and they sent me to uh, uh, Dalhousie University and Memorial University, which had just opened that year. 
And so uh, I actually went to Dalhousie, which was in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, for my first year. Newly married. Um, and w w at that time, we didn't know whether we could drive to it or we had to fly to it. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a, a great year. I then spent time at, uh, in Arizona. I was in Arizona for 10 years. I completed my internal medicine. Um, I did my GI uh, fellowship. And I knew at the end of my GI fellowship uh, that I was incomplete. Because all this stuff with therapeutic endoscopy, it was just starting. It wasn't uh, when I started. Um, we took out colon polyps and we dilated esophaguses and we made homemade stents because you could not buy an esophageal stent mm. and shoved them down somebody's throat, like shoving your foot down somebody's throat to place a stent. Um, and ERCP was really in its infancy. Um, endoscopic sphincterotomy was just getting started. And so all this stuff that we take for granted now treatment of GI bleeding, treatment of common bile duct stones, of pancreatic disorders, the up access to the small bowel, all this stuff that we take for granted now didn't exist. And so I knew that when I uh, finished my training, I was incomplete. So I stayed in Phoenix for five more years and Instead of a trainee, I was now associate chief of gastroenterology <laughs> at the Phoenix VA, meaning there were two faculty instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was there for, um, I was there until uh, 1983, and I've been in Seattle at Virginia Mason Medical Center ever since, the last 35 years. Right. And going back to the to the Phoenix, it was uh, Bob Sanowski, right? Was your Bob Sanowski, and yes, and uh, it, again, uh, there was not uh, when sphincterotomy got started. I did it for the whole state. Wow. Um, when TPN <laughs> got started, I did it for the whole wow. state because yeah. it just it was all new and all unique right. and. Um, I'm not sure I could do uh, total parenteral nutrition anymore. <laughs> it's all been, it, it's gone to the pharmacies and it's gone right. to specialized nursing and what have you. But right. um, yeah, Bob Snowski, um, when I <laughs> rotated onto Bob's service, his fellow, um, his father died uh, and he, the fellow went and shut down the, farm in Iowa. So the first day I got there, I had a 32-bed ward to run, wow. and Bob tried to teach me endoscopy and colonoscopy, and he would slap my hands <laughs> if I was using two hands, and I, oh, it was the worst two months of my life. <laughs> However, um, when it came time for additional training, I stayed with Bob, who became a, a dear friend and um, a mentor for for years. He's your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically right, speaking, right. <laughs> that's correct. So what, what, what exactly drew you to uh, Seattle and Virginia Mason? Did you get a phone call or you applied or how did that work? Yeah, um, my wife was never a desert rat. She, well, she loved the water. She wanted to be someplace um, with uh, water. Um, I had looked, uh, I had looked at one time of uh, training in Seattle and I went there during one of these crisp, beautiful April days and the mountains are out and you, there's the water and it's just, it's gorgeous when the sun is out. And the hook went, <laughs> and uh, I brought my wife back two weeks later, and it was drizzling like it does uh, 180 days of the year. <laughs> and uh, you could almost see fish swimming by. It was, it was that gray. And my wife said, this is it. This is the, 
So she was, she was uh, struck with that. And at the time that I joined the clinic, the GI department was not strong. They had no um, endoscopy unit. They had 10 uh, gastroenterologists, but only a few who did um, endoscopy. There was one person who did ERCP. And um, I thought, here's a clinic of four to 500 people. And uh, why isn't it like other big clinics? They ought to be, we ought to be able to develop gastroenterology, which in fact we've done over the years. We now have 30 gastroenterologists and um, six therapeutic endoscopists for a, a discipline that didn't exist uh, when I first got there. Right. So. So um, over the years, have you reflected, I guess, on what your greatest contributions <laughs> to endoscopy or, or GI medicine in general have been? Yeah, um, I've, I've done a f few things. I um, poked a hole through the back wall of the stomach um, to drain Pseudocysts. I believe I was probably the first person mm -hmm. to do that. I uh, got a lot of grief when I pre presented it because I was told nobody in Europe or Asia is doing that. Um, but it, uh, it, the thought came when I endoscoped somebody who had a transgastric uh, pseudocyst drainage where you could endoscope that person and pluck that percutaneous tube like a banjo string. Mm. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense. Mm. Uh, why go through the anterior abdominal wall, the anterior rectus sheath, the uh, parietal peritoneum, the stomach, two ways, and then get into the, uh, uh, the lesser sac when you can do it just by uh, poking a hole. And of course, uh, EUS came along and what was um, a guess at where uh, fluid collection was is became a definitive uh, way to, to be able to do that. So I, I think um, that was one of the first um, therapeutic procedures where we were col coloring outside of the lines, mm -hmm. where we said the integrity of the GI tract is not um, completely important right. here as long as you control whatever hole you put uh, into that GI tract. Now Jeff Ponsky did that from the front with a, a percutaneous uh, gastrostomy mm -hmm. too. So that was um, that was a big thing and um, it's had legs, it's uh, where it's been um, adapted all over the world with variations on a, on a theme. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, one of the other th things I did um, in therapeutic endoscopy, I was an early adapter of, of self-expandable metal mm -hmm. stent technology. And you and I have shared a, a book mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in that and uh, um, Put in, I think, the first duodenal stent in um, in the country, in the world. I don't know. It depends on. I'm sure people may have done that, but not reported it. Right. But uh, we had at least the first report in the world, and now we're putting those stents everywhere. Right. We're yep. putting them in the esophagus and the bile duct, mm -hmm. and we got a study going on in the pancreatic duct, and. We're putting them in the colon. Se second thing, uh, maybe the other thing that I did that um, has legs was inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just first meet you in, at Duke University. I met you um, when you were working in Chuck Elson's uh, lab mm -hmm. on methotrexate right. <laughs> um, when you were still at UAB. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met you at uh, Digestive Disease Week. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, so I described methotrexate use mm -hmm. in inflammatory bowel disease. 
Um, and again, that, at least for Crohn's disease, has had legs and it is uh, widely used around the world as one of the immunosuppressant drugs um, for refractory IBD. It's also worth mentioning that Dr. Kazarek uh, was president of the ASGE and also is recipient of the Rudolf Schindler Award, which are the obviously the highest award that the ASGE um, gives. So what would you recommend to uh, trainees and future endoscopists out there that are watching, listening? Yeah, I, you know, if I were to uh, do this all over again today, um, what would I do? I, I would do what you did. I, mm -hmm. I trained at a time that there wasn't endoscopic ultrasound. Um, it was a technical parlor trick mm -hmm. when it first came out. Oh yeah, you can see shadows outside the wall. I'm used to working in color. I don't do real well with black and white. <laughs> um, but now uh, it's really opened up the GI tract um, uh, phenomenally, not just the GI tract, but uh, things outside the GI tract. It lets us do transmural uh, resections. It lets us do anastomoses to the, from the duodenum to the gallbladder, from the uh, stomach to the uh, bile ducts in the liver, mm -hmm. from the stomach to the jejunum. Um, so I would, if I were in therapeutic endoscopy now, I would have uh, trained uh, in endoscopic ultrasound mm -hmm. as well as the RCP. Um, if I wasn't primarily endoscopist, I'd be looking at gut flora because mm -hmm. it seems like gut flora is going to rule the day. And maybe mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, they're uh, talking about uh, stool transplants, fecal transplants for almost everything now. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it, the gut flora decides your accelerated cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. Maybe it has something to do with Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot in the neural literature on, uh, on MS and gut flora. So it's uh, um, not only in the GI tract where they're looking at it in IBS patients and inflammatory bowel disease patients and using fecal transplant um, to try to treat ulcerative colitis at least, if not, uh, if not Crohn's, that would be one area that I would look at. Yeah. And are, are uh, going out and doing basically endosurgery in the third space, as they say, is going to continue? And do you think will the notes will ever be a true, uh, truly happen at least in a gastroenterologist's uh, hands, or do you think that it will always be in the domain of our surgery? Well, Eddie, you're. <laughs> You're a surgeon. I mean, right. you're, you're, you're doing things. My whole career has been carved out of the surgical domain. Right. Uh, the things that, and it was at a time that we had to fight for it. It was like, oh, you're, it's, you're taking bread out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and, but now, um, there is very little difference in what you do and some of the minimally invasive right. surgeons do and some of the best therapeutic endoscopists in the world are surgeons. Right. And so uh, I don't know about notes. I, I, uh, th that to me kind of came and went, but what it did do is it brought uh, um, on a whole lot of technological innovation and, and advances. Um, and I thought notes was, uh, was here to stay a decade ago. I thought we could do gastrojejunostomy by just poking a hole through the mm -hmm. stomach and bringing up a loop of jejunum and sewing it to the lesser curvature or greater curvature of the stomach or anterior wall of the stomach. You can do it easier and right, quicker right. with, with, ultrasound. with right. uh, EUS. Right. So right. Um, I think with whatever 
um, is most cost effective, whatever is safest for the patient, whichever is quickest, is going to be the winner. I don't think that's notes right, right. now. Okay. Well, thanks so much. We're going to wrap it up. And again, it's a pleasure having you here. And thank you for all that you've done for me over the years, both personally and professionally. And, um, and thank you. It's a mutual thing, Todd. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.